Jackson, would you please call the roll? Chair Bendy White. Here. Grant House. Here. Frank Hotchkiss. Here. And then would you kindly read the uh, item before us today? The subject today is discussion of animal licensing ordinance amendment to include consultation with veterinarian prior to ownership of an, an altered animal. And then Mr. Wiley, would you like to lead us through what we have before us? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you know, I think about four weeks ago, the committee reviewed this, this subject and uh, asked uh, the city attorney's office to make some changes in the draft. Uh, those changes had to do with number one, fundamentally not uh, requiring a license for an uh, for an altered cat. Uh, so, uh, any uh, cat owner uh, who chooses to uh, own a cat and to have that cat altered would not be required to have a city license. Um, but conversely, any uh, pet owner that had, uh, or cat owner that had uh, an unaltered cat would be required to obtain a city license and uh, in obtaining that license the first time and um, each uh, renewal of that license would be required to show a perm, I'm sorry, a certificate from a veterinarian that the owner had been counseled uh, on the responsibilities of the owner in having an unaltered cat. And um, I, I assume that that probably has a lot to do with making sure the cat is not out roaming the neighborhood. Um, with respect to it, so that was a, a fundamental change that the committee requested. Secondly, we discussed uh, trying to make the uh, for with respect to dogs and uh, a dog owner that chooses to have an unaltered dog to uh, have the veterinarian certificate obviously required for the first licensing of that dog and then thereafter in conjunction with the rabies certificate and I think this draft does that although it it is somewhat complicated and I'm not sure uh, we, we might want to look at that language and make sure I'm following it correctly because the intent was clearly to say to a dog, an unaltered dog owner, each time you have to get a rabies certificate, when your rabies certificate has expired for your dog and you have to go to the vet and get a new one, remember that you also have to get this certificate because you've got to show both to the city to get your license. So while you don't have to show the certificate until you go to get your license, you would want to get it when you're there for the rabies uh, vaccination. Let's see, and there was a third change. Oh, the surcharge. Uh, we created a special fund uh, and uh, a surcharge that any uh, license issued for an unaltered pet, cat or dog, would have a, a I believe the, the sum of $10 was discussed, but that, that actually would get set by the council in the fee resolution. There'd be a surcharge imposed on those licenses and that money deferred into or routed into a special city fund to be used, uh, I guess, at the, uh, it were, this draft provides at the discretion of the animal control supervisor in the police department for uh, educating the public about the responsibilities uh, of a pet owner, uh, an owner of an unaltered pet. Uh, we also have made some changes with respect to the period uh, for which licenses are issued. Apparently the city for some time now has had a six month license and, and you know, um, what I did was I, I listened to the, uh, the committee meeting, you know, a couple of times to make sure I followed everything correctly, but if I understood correctly, the police department was suggesting that we didn't really need a six-month license period anymore, and we could go to one year, two year, or three year, depending on the owner's choice, and, um, you know, and they might want to, and that gives them the flexibility to have it coincide with the expiration <coughs> of their uh, rabies vaccination for a dog. I think that's the extent of the changes. Uh, 
Oh, one finally, then it was my understanding the committee was really looking more uh, uh, for this meeting between a pet owner and the veterinarian, uh, what I would call a counseling session. That, uh, you know, that I, I had prepared just a draft certificate off really the top of my head, and I had suggested that the vet would, you know, list some informational materials that had been provided to the pet owner. You know, I assume that those materials are probably available and that would be something you'd put in a certificate. But if I understood correctly, I, I took that out of the certificate and ma really made this more just sort of a, if you will, a heart-to-heart -heart talk between the, the vet and the pet owner about, all right, if you're going to have an all unaltered pet, these are your responsibilities and this is what you need to look out for. Because uh, there's probably... A, a few pet owners that don't understand the ramifications, the full ramifications of having an unaltered pet. So with that introduction, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Wiley. Are there any questions of Mr. Wiley at this point? Mr. Hotchkiss? I, I, I have a few questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not real clear if, if I brought a, a, a – maybe I'm asking the wrong guy. Is there anybody veterinarians in the crowd? Maybe I should ask that. All right, if I can address a vet veterinarian, then if I bring a, a pet in uh, at five, five, a dog that's uh, five months old, uh, am I I'm told a certain message correct about the responsibility that Mr. Wiley was talking about? Um, and if we enact, <clears throat> enact this uh, and I bring, because it's new, a pet that's four years old, is it, am I going to be told basically the same thing? So come up to the mic if you would. And yes, about being unaltered. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, just, <laughs> I just had some surgery. Oh, thank you. Okay. Could you give your name, please? Paula Kislak. Hi. Hi. So are you asking will you get the same recommendations about spaying and neutering? And counseling, I think we're talking about is what we're calling it, yeah. Um, at any age, the benefits of spaying and neutering to the health and uh, quality of life of the animal would be the same. Right. The recommendation as to longevity, the younger you spay or neuter a dog, well, the younger you spay a dog, the longer they will live. That might not be the exact same recommendation at four years that it would be at five months. But the reduction of things like uterine cancer and um, uh, uh, prostatitis, things like that, would be the same at any age. Okay. As far as um, reproducing and being a problem to the city and, and the county and the taxpayer with um, reproduction of more animals than can find homes, that would be at any age as well okay. for responsible pet ownership. I'm not sure if I'm answering your no, question. No, I think you are. Um, <laughs> and and, a, and a, a visit is 49 to $75 to a vet? Approximately, yeah. There are some that are less expensive than that. Okay. Um, I think that's all I have for you. I, and I'll make a point now if I could. Mr. House, you have a question? Just a, a chance sorry, to catch can, you. can I get your name one more time? Paula Kislak, K-I-S-L-A-K. Kislak, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're a veterinarian? I am, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Kislak. It's nice that you're here. Um, uh, does, so I, I want to be sure I get this because that, that business about the cost of a visit is an important one. Um, if somebody comes for a, uh, a rabies shot, which is required on a periodic basis, would they have to pay extra to be able to have you comply with uh, filling out the certificate that you had that conversation with the person? So the conversation about um, whether they are, are, are more just accounts them about the issue of, uh, of responsibilities of pet ownership vis-a-vis -vis spaying, neutering. I think there are other people that are probably better able to address the, the actual implementation. I know that we are not legally or as a profession allowed to give a rabies shot if we don't have a client-patient relationship. Now, there are rabies clinics where veterinarians are giving shots that's different than in an office visit. But I know we're not allowed to give any vaccines or, or provide any medications without an office visit that establishes a client patient relationship. That's really good. We'll go, from the experience case, of the county, if you had county um, 
residents that have come to you and, and talked to you about um, spaying or neutering? Uh, I'm in the fortunate position that almost everybody that I see knows how I feel about spaying and neutering. And so it, I have a self-selected clientele. Okay. I don't really have people that are trying to resist okay. that. It's I didn't very... to put you in a spot. Oh, like no. That. You don't, we're, just, I, we're just trying to figure the... out how this is going to work when it's all done. That's all. And I think that there might, yes, I understand. I'm sorry I don't have That's the... fine. Others may want to address that when they come to speak. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I, I do. I still have some Hoshkis, more. please. Um, and maybe I can add to that a point on that I think there may be inadvertently additional costs, and this is the one I, what I was kind of getting to, um, with every visit so uh, or certificate visit. So I'm just wondering if the lecture or counseling or whatever we want to call it should be required after the first counseling. We're still talking to the same owner. Right. So... Um, and in the interest of reducing that possibility, um, my suggestion is that when you go back for certificate, you don't necessarily have to get a lecture. Um, so you get it once and that's it. Uh, the second point I wanted to ask, and maybe I should address this to Mr. Wiley, is any problem in exempting search and rescue animals, law enforcement uh, animals, service dogs, and show dogs? Yeah. Mr. Chair, right. Councilmember Hoskins, I, I think so. I mean, I, it's solvable problems, but you know, I, I saw that request previously, uh, and we'd have to define some of these terms. Right. Because yeah, uh, a show dog, for example, I don't know what that is, and, and, and no, don't need a license. That's a show dog. I don't know. You know, so we'd have to. That one strikes me as problematic. Uh, service dogs. I, I understand. There's quite a dispute going on, I understand, from the library as well about what is a service dog. And we have pet owners who say, no, this chihuahua in my purse is a service dog, and I get to bring it in the library. I was thinking, I don't know what a service dog is. Uh, uh, so, I, I see I, your I, problem. I, yeah. <laughs> We, and we do have exemptions in our, in our uh, existing ordinance, uh, 6.12150. Uh, exemptions from chapter uh, shall not apply to dogs owned or in charge or persons who are non-residents of the city, because that came up. If you're just traveling through the city with your dog, it, you don't have to get a city dog license. Uh, including dogs temporarily brought into the city for the exclusive purposes of showing the same in a bench show or dog exhibi exhibition. Uh, you know, it, it just occurs to me, I don't know if there's cat exhibitions uh, well, I just I, I I actually think it's a little far fetched to think that we'd be out there trying to catch somebody at an exhibition from out of town saying you got you need a city license. It's just I mean you, you could exempt them, but it's like I, I doubt we're even gonna, it's it's even going to come up. Not going to be accused of having a cat trap, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sitting outside of Earl Warren, right? Okay. Uh, so. That, that to me answers the the need for exempting show dogs. If your show dog lives in the city and you live in the city, then I think you should have a license. Um, and, and I, you know, so. No, I agree with your yeah. the difficulty of determining right. what these really are. Okay, I'll pass on that. And would it be up to the ordinance, or is this something a council would do that if we wanted to review? The effects of whatever ordinance we adopt, we do that after three years. Is that is that appropriate here, or is that at the council level? E either one, and you know, the committee could certainly make a recommendation. And I've seen it done both ways in the sense that sometimes we'll have in the ordinance an actual, you know, mandatory review period, whether it's one year or three years, in the ordinance. And then sometimes in uh, acting to adopt an ordinance, the council will indicate to the city administrator to bring the subject back uh, in, a, in a year or so. We, right. So. Well, so I, I make those suggestions to my colleagues here that we do have, a, I think three years would be not too much, but time enough to ascertain are we doing what we want here. And secondly, to entertain the idea of just having the counseling once for somebody in an altered animal. I leave that to you gentlemen to discuss. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the uh, once only and the review after three years. Great. Um, any more questions then? We will open the public.
portion of the hearing. And I'm going to look for my stack of people here. And Tom Freeman is first up, and then Lee Heller is second. Mr. Freeman? Is it working this time? It is. Thank you. Good morning. Well, no, it's good afternoon. I'm looking at more. Okay. Uh, Santa Barbara does not need this new ordinance. A memorable experience for me while serving on the task force was being invited as an observer at a spay neuter clinic operation, which took place about two years ago at the Santa Maria Animal Shelter. <coughs> on arrival at the site, my wife and I were greeted by Elian, who took us on a tour of the spay neuter effort while in operation. There were many cages with cats waiting their turn under pro bono veterinarians who performed procedure after procedure in hopes that their dedicated efforts would help to reduce the cat population in the area. Approximately 100 cats were processed that day. The spree de corps among the workers was quite obvious, and I personally came away thinking that in time the cat population would assuredly be reduced by this concerted effort of dedicated volunteers. I mean that sincerely. Perhaps you may ask, what does this have to do with the spay neuter ordinance before us now? It was mentioned in the last meeting that a downturn of 90 cats was noticed recently. Remember that? I personally believe that the successful operation of continual pro bono spay neuter clinics continues. There will eventually be far less cat population in the county because most of the stray cat population will end up being spayed or neutered. And that's the goal. I think the exemplary work of the volunteer shelter workers is the main reason for the reduction of cat population in the county. And credit should not be given to the county's new spay-neuter ordinance because in the long run, spay-neuter ordinances just don't work and will inevitably cause more work for the de dedicated shelter workers in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Yes. Uh, Lee, Dr. Heller, followed by Lisa Reed. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the council, you'll pardon me if I'm a little bit tired. My pro bono work that Tom is describing involved four and a half hours of cleaning up after animals this morning starting at 6.30. So I'm pretty tired and the day's only just started for me. Um, I have a few quick things to say. Um, thank you very much to the city attorney and his staff for the work they did on the revisions uh, pursuant to the last hearing. There's one housekeeping matter I wanted to bring to your attention. It's just a language issue. The section title for a subsection refers to a mandatory license requirement for unaltered cats, but the language is all about, excuse me, for altered cats, but the language is all about unaltered cats. So it's just a cleaning up issue, and I'm going to hand copies to the clerk for you to examine. And, and we have a copy up here, and, and uh, did Mr. Wiley get that as well? Yes, that, that well, it, it should, I think, just say cats. Um, actually, yeah, it, it's easy to fix. It's just a housekeeping matter, and it's understandable when the attorney's office is so busy that something might slip. I, I'm, I'm a professional proofreader, so I have a red pen attached to my right hand at all times. Um, I did want to explain something else, particularly for you, Council Member Hodgkiss, in terms of additional costs and this counseling process. Here's how it works when you go to a vet and get a rabies vaccination. You do have to pay for the visit because no responsible vet will or can vaccinate an animal without making sure that it's healthy enough to be vaccinated. So let's say I go to my vet, it's time for my dog to be rabies vaccinated again. I pay $50 for the visit. I pay for the rabies vaccination. At that time, I am issued a rabies vaccination certificate. It's included in the cost of the visit. And I have to have it in order to license my dog. That is state mandated. At the same time, the vets are now issuing this certificate for unaltered animals as well. So it's all integrated into the same visit. There's no additional cost attached. In most cases, the vets are actually including the language in the existing certificate so that it's a single piece of paper. So that additional cost isn't there that you're worried about. And we, that's part of why the county wrote it this way, so as not to impose any additional burden on owners. Um, in answer to the other question about why people don't just count, get counseled once and never again, an animal's condition changes over the course of its life so that a healthy young female or male that is appropriate to be kept intact might not be three years later or six years later the next times that the owner comes in for the rabies vaccination. And so that's a moment where the vet can say to the owner, you know, I was happy to issue these certificates the times before, but let's talk now about your animal's health and whether or not it really makes sense for you to continue to keep that animal intact. So that's why we're asking that that conversation happen every time 
the animals revaccinated. That can, doesn't have to be more often than every three years. That's the most frequency that you need for a rabies vaccination. And we don't think that's unduly burdensome. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Reed to be followed by Paula. Oh, Paula could like maybe have her own uh, testimony to make as well. Good afternoon. Uh, it, one more small housekeeping matter. It's just wording a wording change on the vet certificate to make it consistent with the rest of the ordinance. You've got um, problems and concerns in the vet certificate, and you're only talking about concerns in the ordinance. So. Okay. So we have. We're taking out problems from the certificate that, okay. I think we had talked about that at the last, yeah, okay. Great. Or you won't have to go to your physical therapist this afternoon. I'm getting very strong in my upper body. So yes, I'm sorry I wasn't at the last meeting. I was in surgery, but I'm glad to be here now. I really want to thank you for for providing this ordinance. It gives us an opportunity to educate our clients, to have the discussion even with clients that might not otherwise be receptive to having the discussion. And it's so important to the welfare of animals and the welfare of the clients and the welfare of the community. Uh, for veterinarians who might have expressed concern about the requirements imposed by the language of the certificate, we already have the county's project pet pet safe brochures. It covers all, and I'll bring these over, it covers all of the um, issues that uh, have any impact on responsible pet ownership. It was created by the county for the implementation of their um, uh, ordinance, but it's really helpful and very comprehensive. And I do also agree that uh, once every three years is really important uh, as a minimum. I profess that once every year an animal should get a good thorough checkup, but once every three years is important and uh, not unnecessarily burdensome. And there will be change, things that will change in the health considerations of the animal. If they've been bred several times, then, then they're probably, uh, it's unhealthy to, to breed them any longer. If they're prone to uh, breast cancers or uterine infections or uh, other issues that um, come along with age or breeding, that's a discussion that I think it's important for the uh, well-being of the, of the animal and, and the client to have at least every three years. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Kisla. Thank you. Uh, Paula, Peggy Langle to be followed by Martha Sheck. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, um, Council Members. My name is Peggy Langle. I'm the Executive Director of the Santa Barbara Humane Society. Um, and some of the members in the audience who are here supporting this particular ordinance may not be able to stay for the remainder of this hearing, and they ask that they be recognized. For those individuals who are in support, if they could please stand. Thank you. Looking over the ordinance drafted by the city attorney's office, um, it is very thorough. Um, on the veterinary certificate, the only uh, item of concern for the Humane Society was, again, the same language on the certificate, um, deleting the words uh, or the word problem. Um, I think uh, building up the statement about discussing the responsibilities of owning an intact animal with the owner is the most important thing to cover in the veterinary certificate. And the only other items um, to perhaps um, point to would be the other existing code sections in the city municipal code that may or may not be affected um, that probably should be looked at, and those would be sections um, 6.12.060. Um, which are the existing code sections that speak to dog license information that may need to uh, be amended also or modified in some way to reflect an altered cat licensing. Um, 6.12120130140, just as a, as a note for the city attorney's office. Um, otherwise, everything uh, looks... Um, Looks good, and we're very supportive of this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Langle. 
Martha Sheck to be followed by Shirley. Again? Jensen. Jensen. Okay. Martha Sheck. I, I just want to clarify one thing. It, it sounded as though people are not aware that uh, you cannot show a dog that it has been altered. Okay. Uh, you cannot so, show a dog that's been altered. That's right. So that has right. to be an exception. Okay. And I should say that um, you, you should be aware that Dr. Kislak is not only a veterinarian here in town, but I think she's president of the National Organization of Veterinarians, or, or at least she has been, and uh, I think she still might be. Are you? Well, I'm on the board of directors now. Now. I was president. Thank All you. All right. So in Santa Barbara, we always get the top. <laughs> Thank you. Um, excuse me. In in Ms. Ms. Madam. Ms. Shep. I, I, I want to ask you a question, if I could. Hi. Right. Um, in pointing out that uh, in cur uh, improving our understanding about show dogs, does that make you think there ought to be an exception for show dogs? You have to make an exception. You'd put the people out of business who breed dogs in order to show them. And how would we resolve Mr. Wiley's problem of what really is a oh, show dog? Just a little bit of language. Yeah, but somebody can say, well, this is a show dog and never show it, though, right? No, that's, uh, that's an easy... So that's that would right. not be a problem? Easy. It, it's a problem, but it's easily solved. Okay. okay. You've, you've raised a, a good concern, and we will discuss it. So thank you. And if we, uh, we obviously have in, informed, caring people here who might help us with that, too. Uh, Any dog, a show dog, a service dog, a purse chihuahua, a ratter, a watchdog, any dog that the owner chooses to remain intact may do so under the current law. So it would seem uh, utterly redundant to add any exclusions that specifically excluded show dogs, purse dogs, ratters, whatsoever. So there's, there's no need for it because anyone who says in consultation with his veterinarian, I elect to have this dog remain intact may do so. You know, I mean, and there may be a person who adores a mutt and wants to breed it. He is free to do so. So it is, it is such a, a simple way to go that there seems no need to add redundant uh, exclusions to it. Uh, I would also just want to point out, since I work at the county level, uh, the need for consistency here. Every time we adopt an animal, do we have to run to the atlas and find out whether the 200 block on Yanaldi Street is in the city or in the county? You know, so we really need to have a consistency, particularly since uh, city dogs are kenneled at the uh, county shelter. So we really are desperate for that consistency. I would also like to point out that uh, the volunteer organizations of which I am a part are working very hard to provide spay-neuter services. A dog adoption and welfare group provides free spay-neuter to any pit bull or pit bull mix. We are now working on about 700 such dogs. So there are volunteer, it's, it's going to be possible for anyone to obtain these services without undue cost. And then as, to the, as to the need for uh, uh, seeing a dog uh, only once, I ask you, the old saw is that one dog year is seven. And I would ask each of you gentlemen to search your heart and remember 21 years ago and see if you are still in exactly the same shape you were then. Thank you. Well, that'll, that'll keep things kind of quiet here for a second. All right, Ginny, uh, Ginny White, I forgot to mention Ginny. Hi, Ginny. Was that a suggestion we get altered? I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> yeah, I, was I, I don't think not. there's much need anymore. <laughs> yeah, consultation in the certificate, I think. Sorry. Um, 
pick your hard act to follow, Shirley. You know, that's not fair. Uh, no, thanks. Um, and I, I really, to tell you the truth, I support this ordinance. We have come a long way from mandatory spay-neuter. I think this is a very workable plan. It just needs a couple of more things, I think, to make it as effective as we all want it to be. I think Mr. Wiley's done a very good job in making it non-onerous. I hope we can all work in this room together to reduce the shelter populations and euthanasia. I don't think we're quite there, but this is a really good step. As far as the, the fine tuning that we can do on this now, I think timing is critical. Um, we need to keep the six month in just as another option. I sent you a letter describing my own personal dog situation. And I would not be able to relicense him because the rabies and the um, licensing period are not quite in sync. And you know, life happens. People, all people can't go right from the, getting the rabies shot to getting the um, license all in the same month. And when it's out of sync, you just need that extra um, possibility to try to make the timing fit together. Remember, our goal is to increase licensing and increase compliance. So anything we can do will, will help that. And along that line, I do support the um, one certificate for one dog by the same owner. Um, I don't think you need to take the vet's time to go through the counseling every time. But by the way, the vets talk to you every time. I don't know any vet that that just gets you in and out and doesn't talk about your dog's health and what the state is at that time. I don't think they need to be required to, do, to give you a certificate to have that professional and medical conversation. It happens by all uh, the conscientious vets already. And I made a couple suggestions here for the wording, and Mr. Wiley, you have that too. Um, to, um, I don't know, I've got these really small font here to get everything on one page. But I, I think this is such a good document, quite frankly, we ought to extend it to all pet owners. As we know, the reason for the population in the shelters and the euthanasia is not just because animals are breeding. It's because people are moving and divorced and they can't afford it or the dog barks all the time or, oh my gosh, I can't afford the, just the dog food or, you know, there's many different reasons. And I think that the vet counseling actually in having these conversations and it should be to benefit responsible pet ownership. It's not because your dog or cat is not altered. I have unaltered dogs because I have show dogs. They've never bred. That, and the same thing for my friends. Just because you have an, an unaltered dog doesn't mean you're breeding. But it is important to do whatever we can to increase responsible pet ownership. I'd like to ask a little more about this. I, I, I did not get a chance to read your okay. letter before this um, hearing, so I would appreciate your uh, focusing on the six-month license question because yes, we're headed in the direction of getting rid of it. So, well, let me let what, me, tell us why me, we should let me read turn. this because I actually mapped it out for my dog. My current my dog's current rabies vaccination is from June. It was actually like June 12, June 09 to June 2012. Three years. The li his license is due in August of 11. Since the rabies is only good for 10 more months, he would not qualify for a one-year license. You can only get a license for the duration of the rabies vaccination. Therefore, the only way I can renew his license is if that six-month option is available. So let's say we get the six-month license at that point. That will be good until February 2012. But at that point, the rabies is only good for four more months. So then what do I do? Now, this is really what I'm going to have to contend with. This is, this is my real example. So I'm actually probably not going to be able to license him. He's going to have to be expired licensed there for a few months until I can get the rabies. Now, a, a good question would be, well, why don't you just get the rabies early? But that actually is a health consideration. There's been many stuns, studies done with vaccinations. There are health risks, actually, with vaccinations. You've heard this in people. There's a concern with even getting children vaccinated as much as we do. So um, it's not advised to get vaccinations early. And I think that we want to be really careful with our timing to try to make that work 
so that people can get their licenses and, and increase the compliance level. So this is for the for the, for the purpose of flexibility to be able right. to synchronize with the rabies shot and right. not push the rabies shot up too early. Right. That's uh, we should keep the six month license. Right. Okay. Um, Mr. House, uh, Ms. White, um, what about the three years? We added that in this um, version. Yes, I think that's that's, a that's extension terrific. From what we were doing before. That's that's a good addition. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, that's the end of the at least the little slips I have. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak at this point? Then I'll close the public testimony portion. And do you have something quick, quick? Is this, is this a... Yes, I'm Randy Fairbrother with Catalyst for Cats. Randy Andy. Fairbrother with Catalyst Fairbrother. for Cats. We're a feral cat organization. We help people spay and neuter their cats that they can't catch. Uh, regarding her comment, uh, if she is getting rabies for her dog and she has a working relationship with her veterinarian, it seems to me that she could just call him up and speak with him uh, about getting that certificate. She doesn't have to have another visit, it seems to me, with the vet if she's got a relationship with the vet, which sounds to me like she does. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right. It's back to the committee then. Mr. Chair, oh, Mr. could Wiley? I add one more thing to the discussion? Because one of the speakers reminded me of this in terms of other code sections. We, we did look at other code sections. And the one that we, I wasn't sure about was uh, wearing or having a collar and requiring an unaltered cat to, wear the, to have the license on it. You know, so we have a situation where... I assume most cats nowadays are going to be altered. They're not going to have any license to wear. They're not, we're not going to, in, a, in essence, require the owner to have a collar on the cat. But uh, so my question is, for unaltered cats, would we require the license to be on the cat? And, you know, of course, we do that typically so we can enforce the license requirement in the field. But... Our understanding here, and I think everyone's understanding, is they're really that's not going to happen. That it's not practical, and the enforcement really will occur at the, uh, the shelter when a cat is picked up as a stray, and someone comes in to claim it, and they say, "Well, this is apparently an unaltered cat, and you you have to have a license." So I, I don't know the answer. I'm just raising the question. Thank you. So with that extra thorny issue attached, uh, it's back to the committee. Mr. House? Yes, Mr. White, thank you. Um, to that last point, I would, I would want to defer, even if between now and the, um, when it comes to city council, but defer to some experts who work with cats to know we looks like we've got a good panel right here. Um, anybody want to <coughs> raise their hand? Because I'd very much like to hear. Um, uh, would that be all right? Sure. Do sure. So, you have any suggestions on that? Dr. Heller? Every cat I own wears a collar and a tag, with the exception of the one who won't let me put it on him. They're all fixed, of course. So it's, um, there is some controversy in the cat community about collars and tags, but it's not only possible but a good idea for your cat to be collared and tagged just like your dog is because it's a mechanism for identifying an animal if it's lost. So it's not an unreasonable requirement that an animal who is required to wear a license to, to be issued a license, wear that license. Um, and many, many people with cats do have them collared and tagged. But we, since we're not issuing a license for altered cats, there would be no reason for them to have anything to wear. Does that make sense? Thank you. Great. Um, well, Mr. Chair, I'll just continue on real quickly. Um, on the th issues that we had identified here today, first I want to just comment to Mr. Wiley. Thank you very much. I think you, you got the spirit and the tone right. And um, we're down to um, really having a, a tool for education for uh, responsible pet owners and for those who uh, just wouldn't know certain things. They'll have a chance to um, make sure that they get the kind of information. And I like the changes, the removing the words problems and from the certificate. Um, I can support that. Um, the idea that we would 
um, take a look back after three years and, and see how it's going. I think that's a good idea. I don't see a harm for doing that. And I don't think we've set out specific benchmarks or criteria, but on the other hand, to have people get together and see how it's going, let's do it. You know, I'd, I'd like to see that and hear, hear on that. Um, the issue of the timing and this idea of the six month, I don't think that's, that would be just any more than when they s sell the license. They put six months instead of 12 months. And uh, so my, my, I can see the val validity of that, and I appreciate your bringing that up. So I would support that. Um, um, I was back and forth coming in today on whether the one time per owner, per dog or cat would be sufficient. And I, tend to be won over by the s seven years per year t argument. <laughs> but, you know, kind of, I, 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 I rather think that it's not an owner. If, if, it were, if, we, were, if we had a, uh, a mandatory spay neuter ordinance, and that would also beg the question of the exemptions. And in this particular case, I don't think for both of these things, I think we don't have that. So I feel that just getting, um, in fact, I'm going to bet that there's going to be some way that this gets so blended into the process that the rabies vaccination certificate and this, if they're not the same piece of paper, it's done just in one fell swoop. And that's our goal, ultimately, is to not to have this cost anybody any extra whatsoever and to have it be an easy moment in time. And, and I, don't, I didn't see anything in our ordinance that required that to be in person. Um, it's possible, I would imagine, that somebody could get the um, uh, conversation on the telephone and get a certificate, um, which would, could make it even better. As I think it would be better if they saw the dog or cat, because then it would be part of an examination. But in case of an off-cycle kind of uh, situation, that might be one way to resolve it. So um, let's see. Uh, and so the, the Put the license on the unaltered cat collar. I think that's a good qu good question and good call. Um, so did I address all of them? And then the goals, and nicely stated by uh, Ms. White, and that is reduce shelter population and euthanasia and increase. Um, you know, this is this is really important. Increase licensing and increase compliance overall, which hopefully will be a real benefit to those who are the volunteers who are doing such a hard job. And I'm not worried at all, really, about those who are already responsible owners, which very much would be those, hopefully, who are breeding responsibly and those who are showing their animals. Um, I'm more concerned of the casual owner who really wouldn't even be thinking about this necessarily, and this just raises it to their consciousness. So again, Mr. Wiley, I think you've done a really good job here, and I really do appreciate it. Um, you really caught what, what I think we're trying to get to. Thank you, Mr. House. Mr. Hotchkiss? Um, thank you. I, I'm not sure, Mr. House, where you stand on the <clears throat> every three years they should come back and be advised. Okay. Well, I, do, I, I agree. There were some compelling arguments. I'm I guess, I guess I can go along with that. And uh, the review after three years is important. Uh, and we are saying keep the six-month certificate because it isn't going to cost the city anything. It might be a matter of convenience for owners. So that all sounds good. I'm a little worried that uh, I disagree with the lady who said it's not going to be <clears throat> more expensive for if we don't exempt show dogs because it does cost more to get that dog licensed every time. So if show dogs are exempted, then it wouldn't, that cost wouldn't be there. That's, that's, wait a minute. So your, que your, your statement is it's going to be more expensive for a show dog to... Well, if somebody has multiple this, show this dogs... This ordinance that, would, re would be, make it more expensive to have a show dog? No. The show, I'm, I'm, we were talking about an exemption for show dogs? That was but uh, perhaps that wasn't the license we were talking about. It was just the certificate requirement. I'm not sure. Do you know where we stood on that? Yeah, I guess I was assuming they meant the certificate. Well, but, yeah, it gets back to the problem of what's the show dog. If it's an exemption from the veterinarian certificate, then, uh, but I, I tend to agree with those who say, well, it, it, it you don't you know it doesn't prevent you from having a show dog it just requires that you get a certificate and as an unaltered pet you're going to pay more for your license yeah. but you know that's true now we are we've got a break in schedule you get a discount essentially for an altered pet yeah. altered right. okay. dog let's just leave that then thank yeah. you 
Okay. Um, so you're okay with things where they are, um, and um, as per suggestions of Mr. House. As per Mr. House's suggestions, and so am I. Uh, and I wanted to at least read. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have page two of this, but my my neighbor and uh, fellow uh, dog walker uh, Janet Vining Mitchell wrote an email, which um, I I hope embodies some of the tone of of the conversation that's gone on. Uh, and that is, uh, she says, um, I believe your ordinance is preferable to the county ordinance, both in content and form. However, I still do not believe that the ordinance is necessary or that it will result in any improvement in shelter population or euthanasia. So uh, I, I'm taking that to mean that her opposition has been reduced to this ordinance. And I hope that at least that, that, the, that this work that's been done by this group is a, a trying to come closer to something that, that is, uh, gains wider acceptance. And I appreciate that uh, and Mr. F Mr. Freeman, is that right, has been staunchly opposed to this from the beginning and has given us, uh, um, has battled mightily to uh, op oppose this and, and given uh, articulate uh, uh, testimony. But I will be supporting Mr. Ha Mr. House's uh, suggestions, and uh, I want to thank um, you folks for coming out. Now, this is the th three rounds here, and obviously many, many rounds at the county to try and, and, and come to a, a place where uh, we've got something that, that can work. So I look forward to having a motion. Mr. Chair. Um I, I am making a motion to uh, move this uh, forward to City Council for final approval with the um, amendments to the um, version that we have in front of us today that include a um, uh, that the minimum requirement is in every three every three years um, uh, uh, that there be a certificate um, that there's a review of the program after three years sometime let's say three years from now or from when it's been implemented that the uh, we put the six-month license back into the mix so we have that six month uh, as well as the uh, other options that the um, license in that one additional um, piece of our um, section rather for cats indicates that the uh, an unaltered cat would uh, be wearing the um, the license and um, that the words problems and are removed from the certificate of counseling. I think that covers it. There's a motion and a second to recommend to council that the spay and neuter ordinance go forward with the uh, changes as outlined. With, with, with all incredible appreciation, as much as I can offer to everyone at, on each side of this, because it certainly has altered my thinking and understanding of this and um, of what we can do here. And I really like, and I, I get a feeling that this is shared among all of us, that we have an educational approach. And it uh, takes us away from some of those hard edges that we were experiencing at the beginning. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? So the motion passes, and this recommendation go forward to council. And then Mr. Wiley? Uh, Mr. Chair, and could we talk about that for a minute? It, it so happens that next Tuesday the council agenda looks pretty light. I believe there was only one administrative agenda, you know, non-consent agenda item set at this, at, as of Monday morning for next Tuesday. Uh, and, and although we don't typically like to do this because we have to start working this evening and tomorrow to finalize this, we could do it here, get it on next Tuesday's agenda. And our only concern was that the community that's in, been involved in this, if that's enough notice for them and for the council as well. That if we were to introduce this next Tuesday, then the, the typical schedule would be introduction next Tuesday, adoption a week from next Tuesday or two weeks from today. So um, the question is, is that moving things along too quickly? Uh, and uh, what's the feeling of the committee on this? I, I'm, I'm supportive of it moving forward. Um, I'm watching the heads out there. <laughs> it looks like there's a general sense that we could move this forward. And, and I didn't know it was possible, Mr. Wiley. Be careful. What, yeah. and there may be an opportunity. <laughs> but no, this, yeah. I, I think it's a good idea, really. But. All right. So any objections? On, uh, all right. Then let's give it a shot. Okay. Thank you. 
Well, again, thank you all for your work and testimony, and uh, we'll be moving this forward to council next week. Uh, this meeting is now adjourned.